turning grading. And um, right now, today, we'd like to discuss uh, something a little bit different than grading. That is um, no grading. Uh, these are the coins that are sent to PCGS that uh, come back uh, without a grade. And we'd like to go through a few of the reasons uh, why these coins come back the way they are and a little bit of our uh, understanding as to why that is. So let's start. Uh, we're going to look at uh, two categories of no-grade coins. We're going to look at uh, coins which we can put into holders. In other words, that will come back with a, a genuine tag or a um, details grade, what we call it. And the second category is uh, coins which cannot be put into holders. These are coins which we would uh, still use the, uh, the good old body bag, which uh, some of you all may remember from years ago. So let's talk about why a coin didn't get a grade, OK? Uh, one of the founding tenets of uh, PCGS uh, from 1986 was uh, the establishment of sight unseen trading. In other words, these are coins that um, might trade among dealers, uh, you know, basis of bid that they might place on one of the um, services such as A&E or CCE. In other words, they would offer to purchase a coin sight unseen and uh, would be obligated to purchase one if one was sent to them. Uh, coins with problems, uh, we had a choice of either net grading or not grading at all. Net grading, of course, means to deduct something for the problem. In other words, if you had a coin uh, that might grade uh, you know, XF, but it had a scratch, let's say, uh, you, know, you could net grade it down to maybe very good or fine. Uh, but that wasn't entirely satisfactory. And that is because net grading does not lend itself to sight unseen trading. For example, if a dealer bid on a fine 12, 14 D cent, for example, he didn't want to get an XF45 with a scratch. Uh, you know, the, most buyers looking for a fine 19, 14 D cent are looking for a coin without a problem. And you can't say, well, it nets fine, even though there's XF detail, because uh, the collector may not want the scratch. So that led us basically to not grade these coins uh, for a number of years. And until the fall of 2008, uh, PC just returned these coins basically in just uh, you know plastic, uh, soft plastic uh, flip. And uh, it said that we couldn't grade it. But in uh, mid-2008, PCGS began placing these sorts of coins in a holder that at least said genuine. Okay? And in the fall of 2011, we went ahead and added the details grade, which meant that we actually assigned a grade to it. It wasn't a numeric grade, but we would say, for example, very fine details or extremely fine details. And that way, these coins could trade you know, somewhat in the numismatic market, even though they weren't part of the numerically graded PCGS series. So let's take a look at some of the problems that prevent a coin from receiving a grade. And please keep in mind, of course, that this webinar is an extremely abbreviated version of our full grading 103 seminars, which we are currently holding at the Long Beach Coin and Stamp Exposition. That full course is about three to four hours, and we're compressing it down to about 35 or 40 minutes today. So, you know, we're only seeing maybe about a quarter of the examples and a quarter of the slides. So if it looks like we're glossing over or going over some area a little bit quickly, uh, please keep in mind that you're only looking at, 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 at a very select few slides. This is our list that we publish online of the numbers above 70 that we might assign a coin that would show uh, some of the issues. Uh, for example, you can read down the left side code number 82, 83, 84. These are the various problems that a coin can have. And I'll give you a couple minutes to take a look at this. We'll go over each of these uh, various codes one at a time and allow you all to uh, see in a little more detail what we're talking about when we assign one of these numbers. Okay, But on the far right side of this chart, you'll also see um, whether or not we can holder the coin. And at this point, most of the problems that you see are holderable. The only ones that are not are counterfeits or coins that we cannot determine for sure whether they're real or not. 
And uh, then, of course, two things that uh, can be damaged or worsened by holdering, that is PVC re residue, which can continue to grow on a coin, and uh, appealing lamination, which has the possibility of actually flaking off uh, during the holdering process. So other than those uh, things, we can put most uh, coins with problems now into to a uh, hard plastic holder. So let's start by taking a look at the coins that can be put into the holders. Okay. First problem is 82, which we call filed rims. And that's uh, rim dents or bumps that have been filed to give the edge an even appearance. That is, uh, um, the reasons that you might find this, uh, removal of evidence of mounting. If a coin's been mounted, it's going to leave a problem on the rim. And by filing away that problem, you'll be able to um, hide that evidence somewhat. A removal of a deep rim cut or a test mark. Sometimes coins are checked for purity and people will, you know, make a incision or a, a, a cut into the rim. And of course, if you might file that off uh, to remove that evidence. And finally is a good old theft of bullion, which is an age-old problem. Back in even back in the Middle Ages, when uh, coins were hammer struck, uh, people used to clip uh, the edges of gold and silver coins and basically save the clippings, and over time build up enough extra gold and silver to maybe uh, use as a medium of exchange. So uh, even in the 19th century, sometimes. People would take a coarse file and file off shavings of a silver or gold coin. And if you do that to enough coins over enough time, you can actually get enough bullion for uh, almost another coin. So that is another reason that you sometimes see this. Uh, you see uh, filed rims usually on the larger silver and gold coins most often. Uh, you see it sometimes on small gold coins that were mounted to remove the evidence of the mounting. And finally, you also sometimes see it on early large cents. And you'll see a lot of problems on early large cents simply because there were so many of them, and they, uh, a lot of them led a pretty rough life. So you'll see early large cents are the uh, source of a lot of these problems. But to have a look at a filed rim coin, here's an example that is a possible theft of bullion. You look around uh, the area from about 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock on the upper rim, and you know around 12:30 on the reverse and a little bit around uh 6 to 8 o'clock on the reverse and you'll see evidence of uh someone filing the rims on this coin so uh we we really don't know why that was done but it's certainly possible that someone was trying to shave off a little gold uh you know in the form of a few tiny shavings and uh like i said if you do it to enough coins over enough time you get a little uh, sack of gold. So that's why that was done. The next problem, of course, is hold and plug. That's a coin that has a, has a drill hole through it. Uh, uh, it may or may not have been plugged at one time. And uh, if it is plugged, the coin is then usually tooled to cover up the plug. And the reasons that are found, of course, is the coin was worn as jewelry. And what quicker way to get a coin or, uh, a chain around a coin is than to put a small hole in the coin. And of course, when this was done, the coin was just worth, worth face value. So you really weren't destroying a valuable old coin at the time. Also, coins were used as watch fobs, buttons, or teething rings for uh, babies, in which cases holes were put in the coin. And believe it or not, at one time, coins were used as washers for slate roofs because the price of the washer went above a penny. At the time, people used pennies with holes in them for washers because they were cheaper than buying a real washer. Again, you often find holes on small gold coins at the top or bottom, worn as charms. Uh, larger coins used for buttons, washers, or fobs. And then finally, of course, uh, colonials were also often found hold and plug. And, uh, in our full uh, seminar, we have many examples of uh, hold and plugged coins. But uh, for this purposes here, you can just take a look. Uh, this is a Gobrak dollar that was hold. And you see the hole at uh, 12 o'clock on the obverse, at 6 o'clock on the reverse. 
And as we noted, uh, because a hole is such severe damage, uh, even plugging it and trying to uh, hide the plug is quite difficult. Uh, so you see plenty of evidence for a hole, or a plug hole in this case. Questionable color, OK? Uh, toning, as you're all familiar with, is a chemical process as a, that occurs as a coin reacts to the environment. And uh, many collectors consider colorful real toning to be desirable and uh, brings a premium. But toning can be added, enhanced, or accelerated by artificial meaning means, uh, creating the appearance or close to the appearance of natural color. Uh, and copper coins as well can be uh, stripped and uh, simulate the original red appearance, which also adds to the value. However, in most cases, uh, these treatments do result in a rather unnatural color. So you, you'll find questionable color again trying to re-add red on copper coins adding spectacular toning usually to silver coins. Uh, masking evidence of cleaning is another reason that you'll see questionable color. And again, it's often found on the red copper coins and, of course, silver coins. You don't see uh, questionable color on gold coins very often simply because gold coins rarely tone. Uh, they do sometimes because of the copper in them. But as a general rule, uh, you don't look for a lot of toning on gold coins. And modern proof coins, believe it or not, people will add crazy color to those in the hopes of uh, getting more for the coin. And here is a rather uh, spectacular example. It's almost laughably bad in this case. But this is obviously a proof 77 Ike dollar that someone has artificially colored. And uh, that comes out as pretty obvious. So cleaning on a coin. Uh, surface damage uh, really is due to any form of abrasive cleaning. Um, now, cleaning is a very complicated topic. It covers a wide range of appearances from a grossly polished coin uh, to one where you can see maybe some faint hairlines. And uh, this is a frustrating call in many cases because subtle cleaning is often difficult to detect. Um, and dipping, which is probably the most common form of cleaning, uh, we often don't consider it cleaning unless it has been done repeatedly or improperly. Uh, a lot of coins at one time or another have been dipped, uh, you know, particularly uh, Walkers, Mercury Dimes, Franklin Habs, Morgan Dollars. A lot of times, you know, if they start to get color, a lot of collectors prefer them brilliant. And if it's been dipped once in a proper dipping solution, uh, just to add some of the original uh, full luster and uh, lack of color back, uh, PCGS will not reject that coin. So let's think about cleaning as something to remove lighten, dark, or unattractive toning. Uh, it can be an attempt to conceal alterations sometimes. Or uh, an inexperienced or non-collector may attempt to improve a coin by trying to clean it. It's often found on better date coins, mainly because they were valued more at an earlier time when the dangers of cleaning weren't as well known. Uh, obviously, 18th and early 19th century coins, many of those have been cleaned simply because there's been a lot more time to clean them. And a lot of times it may have been done 100 years ago when they weren't worth a whole lot. And artificially toned coins have often also been cleaned. Uh, but the artificial toning has been added back. So let's look at a couple examples of clean coins. Many of them show sort of lusterless, glassy surfaces. Uh, you could also describe it as sort of washed out and dull. You see this is a bus dime that's been cleaned, and it just, it, it just doesn't have any character left. It's a very flat looking coin. There's no, cart we, there's no luster at all, no natural sort of gray color. It's just sort of a scrubbed up looking thing. Not, not a very good looking coin. This is a gold coin that's been cleaned, and it looks like it was cleaned very harshly. And you see the buffed out look to the surface. In other words, that real glassy, uh, lusterless, but sort of that artificially shiny look. Uh, these are coins that have been certainly improperly cleaned and would be quickly rejected by PCGS. Cleaning copper is tough because it's, it, it leaves a very unnatural look to the surface. This uh, is a 13S cent. 
that has obviously been harshly cleaned. And uh, once again, we would not put a real grade on this coin, although we might holder it. Another way to, thing to look for in cleaning, even though this coin has a little bit of toning, it also has some light hairlines uh, visible on the obverse especially, and a little bit on the reverse. And hairlines are usually a sign of uh, being wiped uh, or improperly cleaned also. So if the coin is heavily hairlined, uh, PCGS normally will not grade it due to cleaning. Finally, uh, clean coins also uh, will sometimes display artificial toning. This is another example of unnatural color on a coin that was added to make it look less clean than it was. So this, of course, is another example. This coin has two sins. One, it's been cleaned, and then second, it's been artificially colored. So this is another thing that we want to keep, keep a lookout for. Next is a planchet flaw. That would be a metal impurity or defect in the planchet. Now, if it's a small, unobtrusive planchet flaw, that's acceptable. Large ones, badly placed or distracting, we will reject. And it also depends on the coin a little bit. For example, a colonial coin, which was a very uh, prone to planchet flaws, uh, we can accept colonials with, with some pretty serious, you know, pre what might be pretty serious planchet flaws on most other coins because they're sort of part of, the, um, part of the colonial process. But on a Morgan silver dollar, you don't see them very often. So a planchet flaw that's pretty obvious to the naked eye might be caused to reject a Morgan dollar. Uh, the reasons planchet flaws are found is usually the separation of the surface from the core. And that can occur due to metal impurities. Uh, it's a similar to a peeling lamination, but there's no danger of further damage. We'll discuss peeling laminations in a little bit, but that's more separation of surface from the core. Uh, it may be a crack in the planchet due to impurities in the annealing process. That's when the metal is molten and then cools. Uh, and again, it's very often found on colonials and early copper coins. Uh, due to the impurities in the copper. The, the purity of the copper on early large cents was highly variable. Uh, so you see uh, planchet flaws most often on copper coins. This is an example on a colonial. This is a um, Fugio cent that you'll see, which has uh, pretty serious planchet flaws on both sides of the coin. Now. A little less serious than this, we might grade it, but a coin such as this with a flaw this serious, uh, we probably would not. And here again is an early large scent. Uh, this is a 1793 reef scent, and you see the planchet flaw in the upper right uh, portion of the obverse. And once again, that is a pretty serious deep planchet flaw, and that coin, and we would not be able to put a grade on this coin. Here is an Eisenhower dollar, and if you look uh, under the ear on the back neck of Eisenhower, you'll see the planchet flaw on this coin, and uh, it's pretty rare to see. Uh, you, you, you very rarely see uh, planchet flaws on modern coins, but they do, but they do exist. And this is another coin that uh, would, would definitely be no graded by PCGS because of that flaw. Next up is altered surface. And this covers anything added to the surface of the coin to improve its appearance or cover marks. Uh, this would be things like adding wax, dental wax, putty, lacquer, nose grease, etc. Uh, sometimes called thumbing the coin to put putty to fill in marks or scratches. Uh, lacquering a coin, uh, you know, usually copper coins to protect them will result in a no grade simply because it's, it's too difficult to see the surface underneath all this. So usually uh, altered surfaces are an attempt to cover marks, scratches, or other surface damage. Again, usually with the putty of some sort. Effort to mask prior work on a coin. Or sometimes to preserve a coin from further color change or deterioration. And again, this is unfortunate because in the attempt to preserve the coin, uh, you actually do more damage to the coin. And again, it's, uh, you see it on uh, most often found with putty on uh, proof gold and silver. 
and uh, you s usually find lacquer is usually found on copper and nickel coins. Although you can also, of course, find putty on nickel as well. And a couple examples of this, if you take a look at the reverse of this uh, 14D penny, you'll see the remnants of uh, someone's attempt to put lacquer on the coin. That's uh, pretty obvious all over the reverse of this coin. And uh, V-nickels or buffalo nickels, a lot of times if they're lacquered, you'll see the remnants of sort of an oily film on the coin. If you look on the obverse in front of the Head of Liberty, behind the Head of Liberty, you'll sort of see that multicolored, oily-looking substance. That's the remnants of lacquer. And uh, like I said, that's an iridescent film that's seen on the coin. And once again, these coins can't be graded, but we can holder them at this point. Mint state and proof gold, especially proof gold due to its high value, is often the victim of attempts to improve the coin. And putty and wax are, often, are very often used to cover tiny scratches in the uh, coin, especially on the main devices. And this coin, unfortunately, has been the victim of, uh, of that sort of work. Scratches. Scratches um, are no graded, and that depends on the severity or the quantity of the scratches. If you have a faint old toned over scratch, you know, on a large center early silver coin, we, we may go ahead and grade it. However, if it's a bright fresh scratch, we may not. Uh, placement's an important factor, and uh, obviously a scratch in the uh, on the reverse, in a, in a non-busy area of the coin, or a, or a non-focal uh, area of the coin, we may let go, whereas if it were on the cheek of liberty on the obverse, uh, we may reject it. And uh, we got to be careful. Uh, you uh, remember that early uh, pre-1808 silver and gold is, is often uh, the planchets were adjusted prior to striking. In other words, the mint would shave a planchet down if it was overweight, leaving what appears to be vertical scratches or horizontal scratches on the coin. And those are adjustment marks, and they are permitted. Um, a scratch on a coin can be found for various reasons. One is uh, simple mishandling in circulation. In other words, it just got scratched in the course of being circulated. Accidental scratches happen in dealer and collector's hands, unfortunately, very often from staples uh, from the old 2 by 2s It was a very frequent uh, thing you'd see. Or sometimes deliberate damage. Sometimes coins were just scratched by people that had nothing better to do, and they were just had a knife or had a nail and a coin and a little time on their hands, and they just scratched the coin. That is sometimes seen. Uh, you most often find them, larger silver and gold coins, of course, in large sense simply due to the fact that there were a lot of large cents around and, you know, damaging a large cent wasn't really uh, too severe because it was only a penny to begin with. So let's take a look. Here's a large cent. Uh, if you look on the obverse going through the Eye of Liberty, you see uh, sort of an old scratch, but it's a pretty deep, pretty severe, obvious scratch, so we would not grade this coin. But it just sort of looks like it was acquired long ago and, you know, may have uh, been slightly abused in circulation, a little carelessness. Others, here's a 1796 um, dime, I believe, and uh, you can see here that the scratch is, uh, you know, a little suspicious looking. This doesn't look like it was acquired naturally in circulation. This is a scratch that looks like somebody put on this coin intentionally on the obverse. So that's a shame because this, uh, this is a scarce coin. Here's a fresher scratch if you look at the neck of Liberty running through the neck and then to the right of the date. And this is a possibility that this occurred you know, from a collector or a dealer uh, removing this coin from a 2x2 two two, uh, that had a staple in it. So uh, you do often, unfortunately, see that on some coins. And, um, you know, over time, that, that scratch will tone down. But uh, for the time being, it's, it's unfortunately a pretty fresh-looking scratch. 
Here's an example of what I call the adjustment marks on the coins. If you look on the front of the coin, you'll see a couple of uh, pretty ugly digs on this coin. Those look to be deliberate scratches to me. But if you look at the back, you'll see the adjustment marks. Those are parallel lines, sort of diagonal, running from 11 o'clock down to about 5 o'clock through the eagle and the shield. And um, these are not s scratches as we might think of scratches, but these were, these were adjustment marks made at the mint. So uh, if it were just for the adjustment marks, we probably would grade this coin. But the scratches on the obverse behind the Head of Liberty uh, preclude a grade on this one. Environmental damage. This is um, corrosion, excessive toning, or vertigree. That's uh, coins that are usually damaged because of improper storage uh, or excessively dark toning that's unattractive or heavy. Uh, we may also reject a coin for. And that, again, is part of our uh, sight unseen trading policy that if a coin is really horribly toned, uh, it's a very hard coin to sell, and that's not a coin we want to trade sight unseen. Uh, storage in a damp or humid environment can um, cause uh, environmental damage. Burial in the ground, of course, can uh, take a toll. Sea salvage coins are another one that uh, have environmental damage. Uh, you often find environmental damage on copper coins simply because copper is a very reactive metal as opposed to gold, and uh, consequently copper can uh, be pretty badly um, damaged due to that. And uh, early coins, uh, mainly because they were often buried or extended storage for a long time, you'll also see. Here's a few examples. Uh, here is a uh, seated half dime. And uh, due to the toning on the front of this coin, uh, you know, being excessively dark or black, uh, even though that's probably natural toning on this coin, uh, we're not going to grade it because, uh, you know, it looks to be an uncirculated coin. And if you're looking as a collector or a dealer for, say, a Mint State 63 or Mint State 64 coin, you would not want to open up uh, your package and see this coin. It's just simply too unattractive and just too unappealing to collectors. So this is a coin that we would uh, not put a grade on right now. It's a little unfortunate because it's, you know, toning's a natural process. But uh, let's face facts, and in the world of collector coins, uh, nobody, very few people would want this coin in their collection. This is another coin that, uh, you know, is just simply too unattractive uh, to get a grade from PCGS. Uh, you look at the reverse of this coin and you see the toning and most collectors on this would go yuck. And uh, once again, you know, if we were to put it in a holder and grade it even, say, 61 or 62, uh, anyone wanting an uncirculated stone mountain is going to want a different one than this, unfortunately. So this would also be no graded. Here's an example of vertigree. If you look around, especially on the back side of the coin, around uh, 5 o'clock, you'll see some uh, sort of splotchy green stuff. This is a growth uh, corrosion on this coin, and it's unfortunately, unfortunately progressive. In other words, it gets worse and worse. And uh, at this point, this coin is too far gone to salvage. Uh, this stuff is actually eaten into the metal. And uh, you could not remove it now without showing uh, some pretty s serious damage to this coin. So this coin is a no grade. Here's a coin that's been buried. Uh, obviously, it's sad that it was buried because it's a better date uh, Liberty Nickel. But uh, at this point, uh, it's been damaged well beyond sal salvation. So this coin, again, may get a details grade of VF or XF, but uh, once again, it is not a coin that we would want to put a number like 30 or 35 on by any stretch of the imagination. Damage uh, is a little more general uh, than the previous uh, environmental damage. This is any form of metal movement, either intentional or accidental, and damage includes excessive or heavy rim dings and bruises, 
Uh, graffiti is, is often surface damage. Attempts to remove spots. Uh, whizzing is, uh, is, was an old practice used to buff out the surfaces with a metal wheel and make a coin appear to be uncirculated. Uh, damage encompasses a large number of problems. We're going to list uh, the top seven or eight reasons uh, that a coin will be rejected due to damage. One is graffiti. That's, uh, once again, significant distractive etchings. And we distinguish graffiti from a simple scratch and that graffiti is usually a set of initials or some sort of an organized pattern, whereas uh, scratches are, look pretty random. Even, even intentional scratches don't really make any sort of pattern, whereas graffiti, you'll see, really does. Uh, Planchet streak or spots removed, uh, you know, usually found on gold coins. Tooled surfaces, uh, re-engraving, lasering, tooling, any sort of metal movement on the surface. Whizzing, of course, this was the treatment with a wire brush to simulate a mint state coin. Uh, most often done in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, because whizzing was so egregious, uh, it was sort of outlawed in general by the entire hobby back in the mid-70s, so it really hasn't been done hardly at all recently. Machine damage, uh, which can occur from counting or coin wrapping machines. Rim damage, either a rim gouge or a test cut. Again, surface damage, either a loud, large gouge or scrape, drill or chop marks on a coin. And finally, the removal of a mount, uh, usually on the edge or the surface of the coin. And uh, in, our, in our full course, we have numerous photographs and examples of each of these. Uh, but in this abbreviated preview, we'll take a look at just a few examples so you can get the idea. This is graffiti. You see that there's a... Uh, sort of an organ, there you see the initials AK and a little bit of doodling on the head of liberty, a uh, little, little bit more on the back. Of course, these are, this coin is far too damaged to be graded with this graffiti. So once again, it would get a details grade of maybe uh, about good three or something. Here's a little uh, more accomplished uh, graffiti artist. Uh, this coin had some numbers added to it. Why, I don't exactly know. You'd think if they were trying to make a clock, they would have added a couple more numbers than 10. So why this was done, we have no idea. But it was a pretty professional job by someone. One of the most famous uh, tooled coins is the Buffalo Nickel. And you all may have heard or seen of these before. These were called Hobo Nickels. And, of course, PCGS can't grade a hobo nickel, but do keep in mind that there is a collector base uh, devoted to hobo nickels. So even on most coins, whereas the damage might be totally, uh, might totally destroy all the value of the coin, a hobo nickel such as this uh, would have some uh, numismatic value to collectors of uh, these sorts of coins. So this is a heavily tooled coin, but a somewhat collectible coin to the right person. Here is a uh, coin. If you look through the head of Liberty, the hair around the ear going and then down the curls, you see someone has tried to uh, add some detail back to this coin. This is uh, what we would call devices re-engraved. This is uh, re-engraving. This, unfortunately, is an example of a whizzed coin. And you can see the tiny, tiny fine lines, especially available, uh, evident on the reverse from the wire brush. The very, very artificial luster found on the coin. A uh, lot of nice XF and AU coins were ruined by whizzing uh, in, the, in the late 60s and the early 70s. But uh, this coin, unfortunately, has been a victim of that. And uh, while it, it you know, to an untrained eye or a novice, it looks very bright and very shiny. Uh, a good numismatic eye can instantly tell that there's a lot wrong with this coin. And similarly here, this coin is just a real mess. This almost goes beyond cleaning. 
and you can just see the very, very heavy buffing that this coin went through, as well as all the damage to the surface. So this coin is a real disaster. The good news is it's still worth melt, and which is still quite a bit of money for a $20 gold piece. This is an example of uh, accidental damage in a counting machine. If you look over the, uh, the chin and the cheek of uh, uh, Mr. Jefferson, you'll see the uh, circular uh, damage caused by a uh, wrapping machine, counting machine, something like that. So this coin doesn't have a bright future as a numismatic collectible, unfortunately. If you look at the reverse of this mercury dime, unfortunately it's a 16D, but uh, there's been some sort of damage, uh, looks like a machine caused damage on the back, uh, you know, possibly a set screw from jewelry or something. So this coin it has been pretty, pretty badly damaged, unfortunately. And here's a coin basically that just may have gotten dropped on the street and stepped on or run over by a car. But, uh, you know, this is just too many deep gouges, cuts, rim damage, et cetera, to grade. And once again, it's a shame because this is a rare coin, the 21 Mercury Dime in, um, you know, XFAU condition. But uh, that was before the damage. So once again, you have a no grade here. Chop marks are interesting uh, things. They're usually found on trade dollars, and PCGS now will grade a trade dollar with chop marks. But non-trade dollars, such as this seated half dollar, uh, you can see the chop marks on, the, on both the front and the back. Uh, these would result in a 98, because uh, nobody collects seated halves with chop marks, really. Not like they do trade dollars. So this coin would be a 98 due to damage. And here you see massive surface damage, uh, most likely from a fire. This is a 1798 large scent that uh, has at one time been heated uh, pretty severely. So this coin is pretty much damaged beyond having any numismatic value. And would, you know, once again, we could holder it with, uh, you know, details of good or very good, but uh, there's no way we could give this a numerical grade, not even close. And finally, I threw this coin in simply because uh, who knows what happened to this thing. It's uh, not all that old. It's only 13 years old, but it looks like it's led uh, a pretty tough life. And uh, again, I have no idea what happened to it, but uh, we couldn't grade a coin like this. Now we'll spend a few minutes uh, taking a look at coins which you can't put into holders. Okay, these are coins... Uh, that we, that we would not be able to hold her. And um, what are the reasons for that? Well, appealing lamination for one. That appealing lamination is a planchet flaw where part of the coin separates. And the lamination is still on the coin. Okay, so if you, you'll see it on copper and nickel coins most often. And here's what it looks like. If you look on the back of this coin, uh, around the 4 or 5 o'clock area on the coin, you sort of see that sort of cracking area there. That is a possible peeling lamination, and in the process of sealing this coin, that part could come off the coin and cause fur further damage. So this is a coin we would not want to handle or put into a holder. We would just return it in a body bag saying there's a peeling lamination, and obviously there is danger of further damage on this. PVC residue. PVC is used in these soft vinyl plastic flips, and over time, if the coin is left in these flips, it will ooze a little bit of green speck or a slimy green film. Okay, that's the polyvinyl chloride. You see it often sometimes on copper, nickel, and silver coins, very rarely on gold. And here's what it looks like. You look around the, uh, from the 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock area on the obverse through the word dollar, you see all the small bright greenish patches on the surface of this coin. Uh, it can be removed, but until it is removed, PCGS will not seal a coin with PVC damage. Okay, So if your coins have this on it, that will have to come off before uh, PCGS can grade it. 
Uh, a few coins, uh, we aren't going to read all this, but uh, authenticity and verifiable mainly means that we're not sure the coin is bad. It probably is. If we 86 a coin, we're quite certain that it's not genuine. But in the absence of incontrovertible proof, sometimes we just say authenticity unverifiable. That's often due to excessive wear that makes a diagnostic or a mint mark impossible to see. Uh, sometimes cleaning makes confirmation impossible. Uh, you know, again, this, we have serious doubts about this, but we absolutely can't confirm it. It's often found on very low-grade coins, errors, clean coins or coins without original surfaces, and coins without known counterfeit diagnostics. In other words, if we've never seen the diagnostic but we don't like the coin, we'll oftentimes 86 it. And here's a few examples. This coin was submitted as a 1901S quarter, uh, which is a much better date, but because uh, there's so much wear on the coin, uh, we can't see the mint mark, so we just call it 86. We don't know. Here's an error that uh, we just aren't quite sure if the error is real or not. Sometimes these things can be faked, so we 86 a coin like this. Here's a harshly, harshly clean coin, and because we can't even tell if it's real or not because of the surface damage, we'll just go ahead and say 86. We don't even want this coin in the holder because we don't think it's probably genuine. And once again, here's a coin that uh, we look at and we don't like the looks of this. It looks fake, but unless we have an, an absolutely known counterfeit die, we just say authenticity unverifiable. And, you know, due to the mushy, sort of soft nature looking of the coin, we don't like it, but we just don't want to call it counterfeit. We just say authenticity unverifiable. Here's an interesting coin. If you're a sharp numismatist, you notice a 1942S nickel. Take a good look at this coin. This is supposed to be a war nickel with a large S above Monticello. But uh, they're showing this thing as a regular coin. Uh, we think the chances of this being real are slim to none, but again, we can't absolutely prove it, so we just sort of take the easy way out and say 86, which is to say we can't verify the authenticity, so basically no call on this. Finally, there is uh, 90, which is an absolutely known counterfeit. And, uh, you know, these are coins that have usually been altered with re-engraved dates, added mint marks, or it's cast, or it's struck from a known counterfeit die, okay? So, in other words, if we know the diagnostics for sure, the date is clearly altered, the mint mark is clearly added or altered, it's an obvious crude copy, often found on early U.S. coins, key date coins frequently, and certain gold coins. And again, if we can absolutely tell for sure that a coin has been counterfeit, we'll go ahead and give it a 90, and major rarities, of course. And some examples of this, this is a uh, 1795 half dime that we know this is from a bad die. So we would call this counterfeit because it has diagnostics that we can confirm the coin being bad. For one thing, you can look at the ST in states on the back and see the way that lines up. That's not a good sign at all. Indian gold is, was frequently counterfeited because it had a higher uh, value than the melt value for many years. And uh, so, again, we know the diagnostics to look for, and if a coin displays certain filing or tooling marks, we can tell that it's bad, and it's from a bad die, and we'll give it a 90. Once again, key date. Coins such as 55 double dies, uh, these, these were often faked and uh, often done by spark erosion dies. We can take a look at these, and uh, if we know that it's a bad coin, we'll call it bad. This one's bad. This one's a no-brainer. Check the date. Check the type. The famous 1909 SVDB penny. Uh, a lot of counterfeits are known of this coin, and once again, if the coin displays the proper diagnostics to be a counterfeit, we will call it a counterfeit, and this one is. 
Most entertaining, here are the total re-engravings or the crude copies. This was a chain set, but if you look at the obverse, you can easily see that someone has spent a good deal of time totally re-engraving this coin. And something this thoroughly re-engraved, we just, at this point, call a counterfeit because this, uh, there's just too much work done to this coin. This is another very crude copy, a 1795 silver dollar. This was uh, probably done in China uh, years ago, and it's a very amateur piece of work. Most people would be able to instantly tell that this is bad. This is a very crude copy again. You can see the very, very crude work on this and the totally uh, almost ruined appearance of the coin. This we think is a total counterfeit. Contemporary though, similar to this. This was almost laughably bad. This is a very obvious fake. If you look at the shape of the numerals in the date, you'll see that this coin is very obviously fake, just as this one is. Take a look at the uh, date 1921. Uh, you can see that that is a very unnatural looking date on this coin. And uh, the whole coin is just uh, obviously a total counterfeit. Similarly with this, not even made from real gold, probably made of sort of brass with an attempt to make some sort of a uh, coloration on it. So coins such as this that are, that are no-brainers, we will a actually just come right out and say that these are fake. So that is pretty much uh, an overview of uh, Grading 103. And we would encourage you all, uh, if you have an interest in this, to uh, attend the Long Beach Coin and Stamp Expo and attend the full course. And we'll go into considerably more detail on all these. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all very much for attending today. And uh, please uh, be in touch with uh, PCGS Customer Service uh, if you'd like further information on any part of our um, collector education program.